he's going to have these three games to kind of finish the year. So he's got the triangle of triumph ready. It's the Kurt Signetti suck month. Should we make a shirt? I think we should make a shirt. College football has never been better. Interest has never been higher. I believe that we are at the dawn of the golden age of college football. It was an epic day of college football. It was one of those days where you fall in love with the sport all over again. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into the Joel Klatt Show. I am Joel Klatt, and this show, as always, is brought to you by Hampton by Hilton, and we are back for a preview and picks episode here this week as we get you set for, what is it now, week 11 of college football? My goodness, it's going very fast. And we are now, like, just absolutely hurtling towards the end of November. We've got our first playoff rankings. Remember, a full reaction of the first playoff rankings, that is up, so go back and check that out. Now, remember, wherever you are listening to this show, uh, wherever you get your podcast, make sure to rate and review us. We'd really appreciate that. Um, and then wherever you like the social media, we are there. We're like the three amigos. Wherever there is injustice, we are there. Uh, listen. Go watch the movie. It's an incredible movie. Wherever you like to social media, we are there uh, at Joel Klatt Show. And then, more importantly, get to YouTube. And the reason is because we've got some great content on YouTube that's exclusive to that platform. And we have stuff still to come that is going to be exclusive to YouTube. So if you are not subscribed to the Joel Klatt Show YouTube page, you need to go and do that. And then make sure to go ahead and hit that notification button so that you know whenever we drop new content. By the way, on that site and on that platform, what you will find is an incredible behind-the-broadcast episode of The Joel Klatt Show and exactly what goes into putting on a big noon Saturday game. Really proud of all the work that our really talented team did on this show and you're going to want to go check it out on YouTube. So we had camera crews kind of following us from Wednesday all the way through the game until I got home on Saturday night, the week that Alabama played at Wisconsin. We had a live show that week. We take you into the coaches' meetings, into the booth, all of it. So go check that out on YouTube. It's really cool, and, and uh, the work that was done by our staff was incredible on this. So go check that one out. It's on YouTube, and it'll be right there. Pick some previews, folks. Here we are, and the heater continues. It's been a great year for picks uh, so far here at the Joel Klatt Show. 5-0 and again last week. That's our second undefeated week that we've had this season. And now our season record against the spread is now 35-18. and 66% against the spread. And by the way, we're not cherry-picking lines here. We're not cherry-picking unders and overs. These are the four to five to six best games of the week in college football. I give you a score prediction. And we measure that against the spread, and we are doing incredibly well. Again, 35 and 18 on the year against the spread. That's 66%. How do you like me now? Uh, all right. I'm going to be at Ohio State as Purdue comes to town to take on number two, Ohio State. I'm not smirking. You're smirking. Um, Buckeyes coming off that en enormous win at Penn State. It was big on so many levels. You know, I think, namely, they got questions answered about their team. That's where I would start. Now, some fans would want to talk about narrative and Ryan Day and how big it was for the narrative and perception of that team to go out and win a top five matchup. And that's all well and good. But, but to be honest, that doesn't really get you anything moving forward. What gets you something is answering questions on your team. And a massive question that we had leading into that game against Penn State was, what was the Buckeye offensive line going to be like? It was patchwork. We had Josh Simmons go down against Oregon. Excellent left tackle. So Donovan Jackson, the All-American left guard, was going to have to go out to left tackle, play a position that he had never played before, really in his life. And then the backup center, Carson Hinsman, was going to go in at left guard, a position he's also never started at in his college career. Patchwork. And they were going to go to a place that was going to be difficult to play with the crowd noise and against that defense for Penn State. I was very concerned for that aspect of Ohio State's team. I thought that Penn State would play much better on the defensive front than what they did. And you got to give the Buckeyes a lot of credit. So they're coming off a game in which they answer the question of the offensive line emphatically 40 carries, 
They ran it for four yards, uh, over four yards a pop. And now moving forward, you're like, okay, well, if they can move the ball on Penn State and run it effectively, shouldn't they be able to run it effectively for the better part of the foreseeable future? The answer would be yes. The answer would be yes. Purdue is coming off that overtime loss to Northwestern. They've lost seven straight. They won their first game, and they've lost seven straight. Back to the Buckeyes. The defense has figured things out. Ryan Day's defense is a defense that has gotten better since the Oregon game. They clearly, that was the outlier. Just like Georgia had the outlier defensively in the first half against Alabama, you got an outlier game for the Buckeye defense on the road against Oregon. And you got to give Oregon a lot of credit. They went out there and created the explosive plays. And they did that largely because they've got a really experienced quarterback. They protected him really well. And he was able to strike down the field to incredibly talented and more specifically fast wide receivers like Evan Stewart. Since then, the Buckeyes have cleaned up their act on the defensive side. They've only allowed one touchdown in the last two games, one. So you put these things together. It's like, okay, there was questions leaving the Oregon game about the offensive line and about the defense. And in subsequent weeks, what we've gotten is Two games worth of answers about the defense. They've played terrific against both Nebraska and Penn State. And now you've got this answer about the rebuilt offensive line. That's the most important part of what's going on right now with Ohio State. Will Howard had a couple of costly turnovers. He's got to play better than that moving forward. And again, Purdue will also be there. Uh, let's move to LSU. Uh, Bama is going on the road to face LSU. Night game in Death Valley. Alabama is 11th in the country. LSU is 15th in the country. And yet, Here's Alabama on the road, favored by two and a half over Brian Kelly's squad, the home team in LSU. Now, I think that it's it's conventional wisdom to sit here and think to yourself like, ah, oh, you know, people don't go in there at night and win these games. And LSU beat Ole Miss. LSU is going to play better than they did on the road against Texas A&M. And that might be the case. That might be the case. But these are massive massive moments for each of these programs. And the reason is, as we've talked about before on the show, I believe that this is an elimination game. The loser of this game likely does not get into the college football playoffs. I do not see a three-loss team going to the playoffs. If you play this thing out and you create scenarios about what's the record that we can project for teams like Miami and Texas and Penn State and Indiana and BYU and maybe SMU and Notre Dame and all these different programs, there's not a path for a 9-3 a and three SEC team. There really isn't. Even for a team like Alabama with a win over Georgia, I do not see that path, which means that this is essentially a playoff game. And I think both teams need to play like that. Huge for Kalen DeBoer. Huge for Brian Kelly. These guys need this. They need this badly. The question that keeps coming up to me in, in kind of looking at this game is, is Alabama's ability to keep the explosive plays at a minimum against LSU and Nussmeyer, the quarterback. Remember, the last time we saw Bama's defense, they were pitching a shutout against Missouri, and that was a banged-up Missouri team at the time. Now, you know what I feel about Missouri. I don't have to continue to hammer away at Missouri, but that was not a team that was going to threaten Alabama, and they didn't. LSU can offensively, and this defense is going to have to play well. It's going to have to play really well. When I look up and, and I look at, at Nussmeyer, I, I think about the fact that he has turned the football over too much recently. In the last four games, he's thrown seven interceptions. All right, including that huge one against AM that changed the complexion of that game. Let's not forget LSU had a 10 point lead in the third quarter against AM on the road in Kyle Field. Like that's still this team. This is still the team that beat Ole Miss, even though they didn't have the lead until the actual end of the game. Having said that, though, like Bama has given up some explosives. This has been my concern since way back when I saw the South Florida film and prepared for the Wisconsin game. There, there are structural deficiencies to Alabama's defense. You can run on the edge, and you can create explosives down the field. That's still available. Can LSU do that? Um, remains to be seen. I think what's more important is the fact that Nussmeyer needs to take care of the football. We know that. 
Texas A&M's defense did a really nice job shutting LSU's run game down, and they made them really one-dimensional. That's what Alabama's going to have to do to LSU. Nussmeyer's thrown it 50 times in two of their last three games. Again, that would favor, in my mind, an Alabama team. And then you move to the opposite side, and, and you think to yourself, like, can LSU really stop Jalen Milrow running the football? If, if past performance is indicative of future performance, then I can – unequivocally say, no, they're not going to stop Jalen Milrow. Why do I say that? Well, they didn't stop Lenora Sellers of South Carolina. He ran for 88 yards and two touchdowns, and he only played in the first half of that game. And A&M, Marcel Reed, he ran for 62 yards and three touchdowns, and he only played in the second half of that game. So here are these two mobile quarterbacks that went out there and only with a half put up some big numbers against this defense for LSU. And you expect me to think that LSU is going to go out there and stop what I would deem to be the best running quarterback in the country, the most explosive running quarterback in the country, and a guy that we expect is going to play all four quarters? I just don't see that, guys. I don't see that. I get it. Like, the environment will be great, and LSU at home, and it's Baton Rouge, and it's Death Valley at night. But Death Valley at night cannot overcome deficiencies when you do not stop the, the opposing team's quarterback, in, per, in particular when he's running the football. And by the way, Milrow is not their only weapon running the ball. See, this is what's so difficult about Alabama is that they're really dynamic running the football even outside of their quarterback. You got Justin Hay Justin Haynes, Jim Miller, Richard Young. Last time out, they ran it for 271 yards on seven per carry against Mizzou as a whole in the run game. So do I believe that LSU is all of a sudden going to fix their problems with mobile quarterbacks and show up and play great defense? I do not see that. I do not see that. Even if they do, Bama still has the ability to throw it to Ryan Williams, who, by the way, has been kind of quiet since that Georgia game. You hear where I'm headed with this, right? Bama's favored by a reason and maybe by not enough. I don't think the two and a half is enough. I like Bama on the road at night against LSU to win this 35-28. I just don't think LSU is going to be the, able to overcome the one-dimensional-ness of their offense and the fact that they do not stop a running quarterback. For those two reasons, I've got Bama 35, LSU 28, tied by seven, covering the two and a half in a must win. Let's move to the Ole Miss game. Georgia at Ole Miss. So Georgia comes in at number three in the country in the new playoff rankings. Ole Miss is at number 16, and Kirby is rolling into town. And so here's the thing with this game. I think it's going to be very in vogue to say, like, hey, Georgia's been struggling a little bit. Their quarterback, Carson Beck, it just hasn't looked like Georgia. And look at Ole Miss. Ole Miss is coming off a game in which they were on fire offensively. So if we get the best version of Ole Miss and the worst version of Georgia, I kind of like the Rebels. And it's like, well, but wait a second. What generally happens in big games for Georgia? They show up. They show up. Their floor is so much higher than Ole Miss's floor. And I just can't trust Ole Miss to play that well two straight weeks. Let's just remember, the 63 points were great against Arkansas. Jackson Dart threw for just south of a billion yards, which is a great game, I've, I've been told, and six touchdowns in that game. Ole Miss is not entirely healthy on the offensive side, so Trey Harris has been banged up. He's a, he's a beautiful player, top five I think, wide receiver in the country. He's missed the last two games, and their starting running back, Hunter Parrish, is out with a serious knee injury that he suffered against Arkansas in that game. Jordan Watkins has stepped up for them, and listen, offensively, I do like what I see. And you're not wrong if you say if Beck turns it over and Ole Miss plays well offensively that Ole Miss has got a shot. They absolutely have a shot. There's, there's no doubt about that. Georgia in a big game, though, folks. Like. Past performance is indicative of future performance. What do we know about Georgia? When the chips are on the table, they generally play well. And here's the thing. With this Georgia team, I don't even think that they have to play great on offense in order to win this game because we've seen them on the road 
with their defense, totally stifle one of the better offenses in the country. We saw that against Texas. We saw that against Texas. And I'm sitting up there and I'm like, hasn't Georgia won 52 straight games against any team not named Alabama? The answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. Again, we cannot expect Georgia to go out there and sleepwalk in a big game because that's not what they do. This defense is too good. And for me, Ole Miss, there's just too many reminders of, of a team that I just covered in Penn State. Everyone was, was super on the bandwagon of Penn State last week, and I get it, and there were reasons to do that. But the simple fact remains is that past performance is indicative of future performance. And the fact was Penn State had not shown that they were going to win a big game. And Ole Miss is the same. You can't trust them to win a big game until they prove that they can. All right? And so here's the thing. Ole Miss is 0-4 against top five teams under Lane Kiffin. They're losing those games by an average of 21 points. Nothing suggests to me that all of a sudden Ole Miss is going to put together this game that I've never seen before. That's just not a thing to me. I like Georgia. Now, is Beck turning the football over too much? Yes. Does he have to get that under control? Absolutely. Do I trust that he's going to at some point? Yes. Yes. Because he's far too good to be throwing 11 picks in the last five games. Most in the country, by the way, over that. I get it. The offense is not great, but the defense is great. They are getting a great offensive lineman back in the lineup. Tate Rutledge. Ratledge, excuse me. He missed, what, about the last month after that tightrope surgery? He's going to be back in the lineup. That's huge because Ole Miss does get after the quarterback, so that's one concern there. Georgia's not entirely healthy at running back, but folks, 52 straight wins against teams not named Alabama. 52. Meanwhile, Ole Miss is 0-4 against top five teams and losing by an average of 21. Do we really think that we're about to see something that we have never seen before? My answer is no. Georgia 27, Ole Miss 20. Georgia covers the two and a half. They're favored by the two and a half. They win by seven. Georgia wins in Oxford. All right, Michigan, Indiana. Um, who would have thought at the beginning of the year that Indiana was going to be coming in here and against the defending national champion, Kurt Signetti was going to be a two-touchdown favorite against Michigan. Hello. And by the way, like, can we just remember back to this is going to be the first game in what I would call the Kurt Signetti triangle of triumph. See what I did there? He goes out in that basketball game after he's announced. So his first day on campus and he grabs the mic and he's like, you know what? Purdue sucks. And everyone's like, yeah, that's great. Look at our guy. He's getting away. And he's like, and Michigan and Ohio State suck too. And everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> watch out, buddy. Well, here we go. It's his first opportunity. He's going to have these three games to kind of finish the year. So he's got the triangle of triumph ready. It's the Kurt Signetti suck month. Should we make a shirt? I think we should make a shirt. The Kurt Signetti suck month. Here's his first opportunity to prove that Michigan sucks. So here we are. Curtis Rourke, their quarterback. I really love watching this guy play. When you talk about a guy like super connected to the offense, super, um, um, it's the only way to say it, connected in terms of like when the ball needs to be out, it's out. It's on time and it's on target. It's in the proper spot. He's attacking the spot in the defense where the defense is weakest. He's putting players in conflict and then attacking them on time and on target. It's really beautiful to watch, folks. And, and by the way, I guarantee you the co college football playoff committee didn't watch the film of Indiana or they don't know what they're watching because all you can do is turn on and be impressed with the Hoosiers. They've been really good. So he came back from that thumb injury. They hung 47 on Michigan State. By the way, that was 47 unanswered. They are now the number two scoring team in the country. Meanwhile, Michigan still tr struggles like Super struggle bus to move the football offensively. If they're not throwing it to Colston Loveland, they've got little to nothing. Michigan is 128th right now in passing. It's not like they're running the heck out of the ball either. They've been held under four yards per carry in four of their last five. This offense is a struggle. It's a struggle. Meanwhile, 
Indiana is not just an offensive juggernaut. The Hoosiers are the top a top 10 team in scoring defense as well. You've got injuries in particular on the outside for Michigan's defense. Will Johnson left early against Illinois. He's missed the last two games. Jair Hill missed last week against Oregon, meaning like who's going to play corner? Don't know about that. Their status is up in the air, although Hill sounds like he's trending towards playing in that game. Michigan's offensive line has been banged up. Andrew Gentry, he took over the starting job at right tackle a few games ago. He's been he's going to be out for the year. Indiana, everyone's waiting. It's like Indiana, who have you played? But here's the here's the thing, and I think people are failing to realize this. Number one, go back. I compared the resumes that Indiana had at this point last year or this year to what Michigan and Georgia had at this point last year after the first playoff ranking. It is striking. So if you have not listened to that episode reacting to the first college football playoff rankings, please go back and do that because um, that is going to be a, a really enlightening portion of that podcast. You will see a clear brand bias. And what people are failing to do is turning on the film for Indiana, and all they say is like, well, who have you played? Well, turn on the film and watch them play. They've won every game by at least 14. They've won by an average so far this year of 29, 32, excuse me. I keep saying 20. It's 32. And then, like, you realize they have not thrown out a stinker. Every team in the country, everyone, has played at least one game where you sit back and you think to yourself, like, what was that? What was that? That was on, like, I would categorize the left side of the bell curve, on the poor side of the bell curve. Indiana hasn't done that. They have been the model of consistency. You can tell me that they haven't played anyone, and I'm telling you they've done exactly what they needed to do against a schedule in which you can say they haven't played anyone. They have thoroughly dominated every opponent. Michigan is limping into this game. I do not think that the 13 and a half is enough at this point. I think Indiana's line, which is similar to what Oregon's line was with Michigan last week, so you know that Vegas is not underrating Indiana. They aren't. They see what I see. The playoff committee might not see it, and maybe all of America hasn't seen it yet, but this team is damn good. And trust me when I tell you this, because of the sentiment that Kurt Signetti had at the beginning of the year, not just they're like, oh, Michigan sucks and Ohio State sucks, the sentiment that they're like, he's got a chip on his shoulder, and now he realizes that he's going to have to go prove it with margin. He's going to have to go prove it because no one's respecting Indiana, and he's going to think to himself like, well, will they respect this? They will not take their foot off the gas. I like Indiana 31-14 over Michigan. In a huge win, they cover the 13 and a half. Give the 13 and a half. Indiana will not stop on Saturday. And this is a better team than Michigan. In fact, at this point, a far better team than Michigan. This is easily a top six team in the country. They did not get ranked there by the College Football Playoff Committee. I do believe that that was brand bias. They will win this game. And I think they win it big, 31-14, Indiana over Michigan. All right, Colorado travels down to Lubbock, and they're going to face Texas Tech. Colorado 20th in the first playoff rankings. Deion Sanders and what he's done at Colorado is nothing short of remarkable in a short time from what they were when he got there. Not a lot of people want to give him credit. Not a lot of people want to actually dive in and see that this team is, is fundamentally a really good football team at this point. It is not all flash. It is not all PR. Their defense is is good to quite good, in particular in the second half. Shador is likely the best quarterback in the country. Travis is likely the best player in the country. And they're going to be tough to beat. That's a reason. There is a reason why they are three-and-a-half-point favorites in this game on the road against Texas Tech. Texas Tech, I think, is going to be their hardest game for the remainder of the season. They're going to face Utah next week. By the way, we'll be there. Big Noon Saturday will be there. I cannot wait to get back to Boulder um, and, and watch this team. But this one is going to be their hardest game. They've got Utah, then they've got Kansas, then they've got Oklahoma State. This is their hardest game. They need some help from Kansas State, probably someone to knock off Iowa State if that happens. 
This team is going to be in line to go play for a Big 12 championship, which means that they would be 60 minutes away from playing in the college football playoff, two years removed from losing 11 games by an average of 29 points. Remarkable. It's remarkable. And no one wants to give him his flowers. And it's like, fine. I guess I'm going to have to be the guy, although I don't... I don't want to have to be the guy as an alum to be like, hey, everybody, Dion's doing an incredible job, but I guess I'm going to be that guy. Tech is coming off that upset win over uh, Iowa State last week. And again, this is going to be Colorado's toughest job. I think a lot of this comes down to the defense for Colorado. Rob Livingston has done a great job with that defense. He's their coordinator. They've been terrific, as I referenced earlier, in second halves of games in particular. They're allowing six and a half points in the second half, on average, that's seventh best in the country, folks. Okay, so they're playing well on the defensive side. I really loved what Joey McGuire from Texas Tech said this week in his press conference. One, he's familiar being a former high school coach with Sanders and the Sanders you know, um, kids in terms of playing. He actually coached the eldest Sanders. He's got a lot of respect, and rightly so. Shadur is the best quarterback in the country. Travis is the best player in the country. They can throw it on anybody as long as Shador is getting some time, and that's what they've provided. They've only allowed one sack in each of the last two games. If he gets that level of protection, Colorado wins the game, period, because he's that good. The wide receivers are that good. Jimmy Horn Jr. doesn't get talked about, but he's one of the fastest players in the country. I think Travis Hunter should be at the top of the list for the Heisman Trophy, and let's just put it to you this way, and and this is... This is 100% honesty right here. If you are creating a list of five players for the Heisman Trophy, Colorado has two on that list. Absolutely. Absolutely. Travis Hunter is on the list. Shadur Sanders is on the list. Ashton Genty is on the list. Dylan Gabriel on the list. Cam Ward on the list. Like, that's kind of the five. That's kind of the five. Shadur does not get the credit he deserves, but he is he is so good. Travis is at the top, at least of my Heisman list and many others. This is a team, and or excuse me, a player that two weeks ago went eight catches for 153 yards and two tut- tutties against Cincinnati. He's incredible. And Tech is going to have a matchup problem with that passing game. This is a matchup game. Where, where Tech is strong, Colorado is weak. And where Colorado is strong, Tech is weak. And Colorado can throw the football, and Tech has the second-worst pass defense in the country. Over 300 yards per game allowed. That's a problem for them because they're facing the best quarterback in the country, one of the best wide receiver rooms in the country. Now, where Tech is strong, Colorado is weak, namely the fact that they can run the football. You know, you look up, and and their, their offense goes through Taj Brooks. He's fifth in the country with 130 yards per game. And so the question then remains like, which Colorado defense are we going to get? Is it the defense that played really well against Central Florida and that quality run game in the UCF matchup? Or is it the defense that really struggled against Kansas State and their run game? I guess that that remains to be seen. I like the fact that that Colorado is, is real. Their defense is real. And the matchup of Shadur throwing against what is the second worst pass defense in the country is too much to overcome. I do not think Taj Brooks can overcome that. Although I know, because I've played there, Lubbock is an incredibly difficult place to play. So I don't love the three and a half for Colorado, but I like them winning this game. I could see this being a bit high scoring. Both defenses struggling a little bit, but I think Colorado's defense in the second half gives them enough time for Shadur to get going against that porous pass defense of the Red Raiders. And I got Colorado winning this one 34-31 in Lubbock. Their dream run continues. They rise in the rankings, but I don't like the three and a half. So I'll take the points with Tech, but I think Colorado wins the game 34-31. Last one, BYU at Utah. Okay, here we go. We got a little rivalry game. Can BYU keep it on the rails? Huh, Kalani Sataki? They've got this unbeaten season, this magical season. They remind me a lot of that TCU team from a couple of years ago. Gritty quarterback, veteran defense, winning games in in a number of different ways. They've won with specials. They've won with defense. They've won with offense. They are running the football better right now. And that's why I think like, okay, this is this has more substance to it 
than maybe even that TCU run, even though TCU made it all the way to the national championship. But when you look at BYU, man, with LJ Martin back in the fold at back in, in the backfield, he's their running back. He's gone for over 100 yards in their last two games. Okay. They've rushed for over 250 as a team. And, and they're going to face a team in Utah that is reeling right now. Utah has no idea what they're doing offensively. And I think it's too much to overcome because you know BYU is going to be ready to go. I, I get it. Like, they're traveling up to Salt Lake. It's the short drive up north. They have not won in Salt Lake since 2006, but this is the game that they're going to end up winning. Offense for Utah is not good enough. They failed to reach 20 points in any of their last four games. There's questions at quarterback. Is it going to be Brandon Rose? Is it going to be Isaac Wilson? Is that enough experience against a really veteran BYU team? I don't think it is. The line is down to three and a half. I don't trust that. I don't trust that. I I just think BYU is a far better team, and you're going to get their full attention. This is not like just going into, it's a tough place to play, and Utah's better than their record. No, no, no. You get their full attention, speaking of the Cougars, because it's a rivalry. These two teams do not like each other. All right? And I know, like, with BYU, you can't use the Chappelle line, like, if you have hate in your heart, let it out, because they're at BYU. They're not supposed to have hate in their heart. So I can't use that line, but they don't like each other. That's fine, whether they're admitting it or not. I like BYU in this one. I like them by 10. That three and a half is weird to me. Maybe I'm the crazy one, although I'm 66%. Aha, where's the spoon? BYU 27, Utah 17. I like them by 10. They're covering the three and a half. Those are the picks. Bang. Here we go. Let's recap them. We've got the night game in Baton Rouge. We've got Death Valley at night, and I like Alabama going on the road and covering the two and a half. That's right. That's right. Jalen Milrow, baby. LSU can't stop the running quarterback. I like Georgia on the road, covering their two and a half. When's the last time Ole Miss won a big game? I'll wait. I don't have time to wait any longer. Georgia covering the two and a half. Indiana in the triumphant of, of Michigan, uh, Ohio State, and Purdue. It's the triangle of suck for Kurt Signetti. It's his way he, he makes that whole rant at the end of the basketball game. This is where it starts. 13 and a half ain't enough. Michigan can't move the ball. Indiana is damn good. They cover. Tech Colorado, I'm hedging. I get it. You all are going to roll your eyes. It's like, I think Colorado wins the game 34-31. That's a tough place, though, and Tech is better than people think. And again, it's it's strength against weakness and weakness against strength on both sides of the football. Tech should be able to run it. Colorado should be able to throw it. Too much Shadur, too much Travis. They win it 34-31, but Tech take the three and a half. And then BYU, let's go. Again, you cannot say BYU. You have no hate in your heart, BYU. I'll say it for you. If you have hate in your heart, let it out. It's a great rivalry game. They don't like each other. They'll be ready. Three and a half ain't enough. Three and a half ain't as long. We're 35 and 18, folks. 5-0 and last week, and I will not say that I'm confident this week because every time that I say that, we go we go 1-4. and four. So I, I don't know. I'm taking road favorites. I'm, I'm, I'm giving 13 and a half. Like, am I confident? Not really. So we'll see how it goes. Make sure to get to YouTube. Okay, again, we've got that behind the broadcast video up. You're going to want to check it out. It's really great, and everybody – on the crew here did such a phenomenal job on that video. So I want you to go check it out. Follow us on social media at Joel Klatt show. I'll be in Ohio state, Purdue traveling to Ohio state. We'll see how that game winds up and uh, we'll be back. When will it be Monday? We'll be back Monday recapping what I know will be a great weekend of college football. Have a great weekend, everybody.